Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So let's talk a little bit about blade proportions or blade shape um, in comparison with the function of the blade, and this is for swords specifically, um, but also the potential quality of the steel involved. So this is a somewhat complex uh, topic, but I've been giving it some thought um, over a few years actually, and I've kind of touched on this in previous videos. But I don't think I've really addressed this as a specific topic. So let's start out with a basic premise. So I pick up, pick up two swords, okay? Number one, we've got an 11th century style arming sword, knightly sword. And above, we've got a 17th century rapier, okay? Now, clearly, these are extremely different looking swords. Well, I say extremely to an average person in the street, I suppose, they've both got hilts, they've both got blades, you can cut and thrust with both of them. But as you can see, they do have very, very different proportions. Now, the general assumption, and I've, I'm not going to say that this is wrong, but the general assumption is that a sword with a broad blade like this is um, primarily, or shall we say, um, optimized for cutting. Not to say you can't stab with it, of course, any pointy bit of metal can be used to thrust, but it's not got a nimble point. The point of balance is relatively far up the blade and there's quite a lot of metal in quite a thin, wide form. So clearly that type of blade um, has cutting in mind, doesn't it? Whereas someone looks at a narrow blade like this and doesn't instantly think that that's for um, chopping through things effectively, but uh, it may very well be um, more nimble at the tip We've got less mass at the tip, so we can therefore, there's less inertia, we can move the tip around more easily, and therefore it's more catered towards thrusting. It, for anyone who doesn't know, yes indeed, this has a blunt tip, this is um, an actual fencing version, but the size and weight and balance and everything else of this is based on one actually in the Wallace collection. Now some people may think that this sword is much heavier than this sword. In fact, they weigh pretty much the same, okay? They're both actually fairly hefty swords. This is exactly the same weight as the real example in the Wallace Collection, which dates to about 1640 um, and is English, and uh, that is 1300 grams. This is a fairly big um, arming sword, and this also weighs about 1300 grams, perhaps even slightly under. So the rapier may actually be slightly heavier than this massive sword underneath. Now, part of that is, of course, because of the complex hilt. So any sword that you start to get complex hilts on, in other words, more uh, protection for the hand, you add a lot of weight to the sword in total. Okay, so whilst this has a lot of um, mass in the blade, it doesn't really have very much mass at the back end of the sword, um, whereas this has much more at the back end of the sword and much less at the hitting end, okay? So, which obviously gives a very different, um, a different feel in the hand, gives very different inertia. It means that more of the mass of the blade is at the back of the sword, so it's closer to your hand, therefore easier to wield. So, 1300 grams with this type of sword does tend to feel heavier than 1300 grams with this type of sword. But let's go back to the assumption that this is a cutting sword and this is a thrusting sword. Well, first of all, I'm not gonna say that's wrong, okay? To a certain extent, any blade which specifically has a broad um, cutting portion to it, like this does. I mean, let's pick up the extreme example, okay? So here is a falchion, okay? Many of you will recognize this sword. Um, and clearly this is even wider. And yet, interestingly, this also weighs 1300 grams. Why does it weigh the same? Well, quite simply, there is less blade length. So um, pretty much that much of blade is not on the end of this. So we make up for some of the weight there. But secondly, whilst this is very broad, um, let's just put the arming sword down for a second. Whilst this is very, very broad, it's relatively thin, okay? So it's a bit like a giant machete. For any of you who's familiar with um, normal garden machetes um, for clearing foliage, um, you'll know that they're very thin blades. They're actually not particularly well suited to combat because they're, they are too thin. This, however, because it's very wide, so it's very thin, but it's very wide, it keeps quite a lot of rigidity by virtue of the fact that the metal is squished out into a very wide shape. Now, clearly this is optimized for cutting. No one is gonna 
think or argue that this, oh, this is a thrusting sword. Well, no, clearly not. Clearly that is a cutting sword. And we've talked about the falchion um, and messers and similar weapons in the past. Um, so yes, that is a cutting sword. However, now we come to a somewhat more complex case. Okay, so what is that? Well, it's an arming sword. It's of a sort of, um, shall we say, end of the 13th and through the 14th century design. We primarily call this a 14th century um, style sword, although this type of sword was still in use in the 15th century. And in, in fact, that type of blade was still in use in the 17th century, but on a hilt more like we saw on the rapier. So this type of blade was actually in use for a very wide period of time. Now, think for a second about what portion of this blade you're cutting with, okay? You're not cutting with the tip, you're not cutting with the big wide blade down here, you're cutting with that portion there, okay? Now let's have a look at the width of that blade there. Compare that to the cutting portion of the blade here, okay? It's around two thirds, okay? Or even if we were cutting further up here, it's maybe half. So whilst this medieval arming sword is very different to the previous one, and obviously it handles very differently because it's, it's almost like a halfway point between the first arming sword I showed and the rapier. This is somewhere halfway between the two. And interestingly, it's also kind of halfway between the two in, in date point. Although, as explained, the broad blades go all the way through. The narrow blades actually start earlier than some people realize. You get narrow blades in the 14th century and right the way through to modern times. Um, and equally, you get blades like this that are tapered. So we've got to ask why, if that's the cutting portion of the blade, why, is it, why doesn't it need to be broader? Well, let's just stop for a second and take a little time out and consider a completely different sword from a different culture, the Japanese katana. Okay, so this is a famous cutting sword, isn't it? This is a sword which is um, was recognised throughout the what we would call the medieval and renaissance eras into modern times and still today is recognised as a well-performing cutting sword. But it doesn't cut because it has a broad blade, because actually it doesn't have a broad blade, does it? If we compare it to, I mean, compare it to the extreme example, compare it to the falchion, very clearly this is the optimised European cutting sword of the Middle Ages. And this is completely and utterly a different shape. Nowhere near as broad. Um, and yet we copy it, we compare it rather to the 11th century, um, what some people might call a broadsword, but an, an arming sword, a knightly sword. And again, this is about half the width of this. Um, is the edge geometry different? Yes, the edge geometry of the katana is actually more like what we would call a back sword. Okay, um, so let's put the medieval swords down for a second. So, you don't need a wide blade to cut well. Does it make the sword cut better? Well, I often show sabers um, in my videos. Ironically, I don't have a saber easily to hand apart from this one up here, which is actually one made for, um, I believe, for a, for a child. It's a slightly small size one, but. Sabres themselves are pretty good cutters. Now, I've um, got several sharp sabres and I cut with them. I cut with all of the swords, all of the sharp swords anyway, that I'm showing in this video. And sabres can cut just as well as, um, as a lot of medieval arming swords. And yet they're generally much lighter and much narrower. They're quick and light to move, um, but they can still cut really well because so what you lack in inertia near the tip you make up for in acceleration, in speed, um, hitting the target. Now that does mean that you're going to perform slightly differently against different types of targets. So a heavy blade that's slower moving will generally speaking, um, in my experience anyway, chop further into very heavy or resistant targets, whereas a lighter and quicker moving sword will perform better against um, lighter targets um, with less coverage on them. Uh, as a simple example, person wearing a gambeson. Um, against a person wearing a gambeson, in my experience, something like a falchion or quite a, a, quite a heavy blade or indeed something like an axe will perform best. A lighter sword will perform worse. Um, but against um, uncovered meat, um, the light sword can do just as well or sometimes better 
than the heavier, slower moving sword. So it's a complex topic. But um, coming back to the katana for a second, um, the katana is actually about the same width as most European sabers. So by the 19th century, despite the fact we went through completely different routes of evolution, completely different warfare, for hundreds of years Japan was isolated from the outside world and really only fought with themselves, despite that, by the 19th century, we end up with two blade types in Europe and in Japan that are actually not very similar. In fact, if we bring China into it as well, Chinese swords equally, um, whilst they can be broad like a falchion, they can be a dadao as it's called, um, a large or dao meaning knife, a large knife, or it can be um, a narrower jan type blade. Um, so actually, if we look in China, we can find examples of the narrower blades and the broader blades. Um, but in Japan, you end up with a blade that's roughly the same width or very similar width to European sabers. So, reverse engineering this, if those swords by the 18th and 19th centuries, people were finding that you could cut perfectly well enough with a blade of this width, why did these swords achieve such widths? Why were they so wide? Well, <laughs> This is the big question, and I'm not going to make definitive statements necessarily in this video. You're very welcome to post your views, your ideas below here. But I think we have to bring in a third or additional, should we say, I'm not sure how many points I've got to now, um, but what I would see as a, a, not just a simple evolution of use, so necessarily what cuts better and then what cuts better against different materials, let's bring in a third element as well, and that is material. What is the blade made of? Right, so it is without question um, true, let's swap over swords again, <laughs> it is without question true that when they were making blades in the 11th century, with the exception of um, Ulfbert swords, and we're talking about Europe here, so with the exception of Ulfbert swords, which were made of imported crucible steel, ignore those. If we're looking at normal um, normal, you know, regular quality or even good quality non-crucible steel, if we're looking at normal medieval European swords in the 11th century, um, the average quality of the steel was not as good as it was in the 14th century. By the 14th century, um, the bloomery process and the way of mass producing more homogenous, um, high carbon, good quality steel was, had definitely moved on um, by, uh, by three to four hundred years. Okay? In that time there had been technological advances which meant that good quality steel was available in larger quantities. Um, and if we look at the steel um, within blades that have survived in museums and archaeologically found, we can find, generally speaking, that as we go through the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, on average, it seems to be um, that the steel used in blades gets more consistent and better. Okay, so if we look at something like edge hardness, and we look at medieval European blades ranging across from the 11th century to the 16th century, um, then we often find that in the earlier period, there are some blades which appear to be good quality, but when tested for hardness and tested for slag content, that is impurities, are actually really quite poor. Um, now, if we just go back to the Japanese sword for a second, we know that in Japan they weren't uh, making crucible steel as such, in other words they weren't making a homogenous melted and then solidified steel, but what they were doing was an incredibly lengthy process that meant that the quality of their steel, at least for the blades that have been preserved and survived, they probably made, well they did make munition quality wakazashis and stuff like this for, for uh, spearmen and, and, and musketeers, but if we ignore those, if we look at the, the quality blades that have survived, they were making steel of a very high quality, despite the fact they were starting out with quite poor raw materials. Um, the, blades, the blade making process that they did in Japan did result in a very good quality and reliable steel with a very hard edge by using the edge quench method where the back and sides of the blade are covered in clay. Um, so you get a differential hardening. So we could perhaps say that as steel quality 
or should we say blade technology, that is the knowledge of how to harden it and temper it as well, as it improved, it enabled the manufacture of new shapes of blade which wouldn't have been reliable or practical earlier. Now, one possible piece of evidence to support that is that um, whilst there is a, uh, as we've mentioned, there's a gradual trend throughout the medieval period in Europe, if we just come back to Europe, from the, the 8th, 9th, 10th century, the Viking era, um, through the, the Norman period and into the kind of the higher Middle Ages, there is a trend from broader, slightly shorter blades to blades of gradually becoming narrower and more tapered and getting longer. So that would, that would tally with this technological advancement. In fact, there are some examples of tapered pointy blades in the Viking era, but they're rare. Which suggests, if there were some of these tapered, more pointy blades in the Viking era, it wasn't that those tapered, pointy blades were somehow inappropriate for Viking era warfare, or not good, or not desirable. It's not only a question of the weapons being designed for the type of warfare, the type of combat that was happening. But it could be that, quite simply, they recognised these more tapered blades, these more uh, pointy blades, were great, but they didn't trust the materials and the heat treatment that they were using enough to regularly make blades like that. If you were a sword maker, if you were a blade maker in the 11th, 10th century, and um, your blades broke in combat, and the person whose blade broke and survived came to see you, I suspect that it would be a short conversation um, and a quick end. Um, I suspect that blade makers were held to quite high standards, and if their products didn't survive and didn't, didn't protect someone through um, you know, mortal combat, then probably life wouldn't be too good for that person. So you want to make a blade, much like military weapons in the last couple of centuries, you want to almost over-engineer something to reduce the chances of failure. You'd rather have a blade that notches up and that bends than breaks, okay? So, if we come back to the tapered arming sword, this isn't a sword that is that broad because we're hitting someone with two inches wide, or whatever that is, two and a half inches wide of steel, okay? We're actually using a sword that is that wide. That's what we're cutting with. We're cutting with this width. So, why is the blade that broad at the base? Well, my answer is um, many reasons. <laughs> so, but one possible answer is strength. Okay? If we have a weapon where we only need that much width up here to perform enough of a cut to lop someone's arm off or chop through someone's neck, we don't need a blade that's wider up here. We don't need that extra width. And also, we're now using more thrusts in the style of combat that we're doing with sword and buckler or whatever, sword and shield. And we want the point to be able to punch through man and this kind of stuff. So these two things marry up. It is a compromised design. Many people I can see will, will be watching this video and go, oh, well, the reason it's narrow is because we want to have a pointy sword. So it's a compromise. Yes. But equally, that much blade must therefore have been seen as wide enough to be effective to cut with in the 14th century, when there was lots of hardcore combat, combat going on with lots of armour in and out of armour. So that was seen as enough. And equally, notice the width of that blade is roughly the same as a katana at the cutting point, at the centre of percussion. And, although this sabre that I've grabbed was a little bit on the thin side, it's not far off a sabre as well. Most sabres being wider than this, of course. Okay. So, um, I don't think that width is always an indication of use. Sometimes width is an indication of material. If we bring it back to the rapier that I showed at the beginning, rapiers are commonly seen as thrust-centric swords, and I wouldn't contradict that per se. But we know from countless rapier treatises that people were still cutting with rapiers. Moreover, we know that a blade that is this narrow might not be able to cut great, it might not be able to cut as well as a medieval arming sword, or a, certainly not as a katana or a sabre or something like this, but it still can cut enough 
rocks that do a lot of damage to a target. And with relatively tight, small movements, you get with the longer blade a huge amount of momentum into that end of blade. Because remember, with the longer blade, the tip is now traveling at much higher speed than it would be with a shorter blade. So, um, there are other issues with cutting with a rapier. There are things to do with the harmonics, the way that they wobble because of the extra blade length, uh, the fact that the point of balance is closer to the hand, most of the hilt is at the base, the inertia is not near the tip, and other issues. The fact that edge alignment can be more difficult with a more narrow blade and this kind of thing. So there are other reasons why these aren't great cutters, but they can still cut. And all of the rapier treatises, um, at least for normal types of rapiers, have cutting in them. Even some small sword treatises have cutting in them. So these were still cut and thrust swords, and I can testify, and my training partners can testify to the fact that when you get hit with this sword or any of the other long rapiers, even if the edge alignment's wrong, even if it wouldn't necessarily have cut through clothing, they hit really hard. They might not look like it, but because they're long, and this is still a 1300 gram weapon, this still weighs the same as the 11th century arming sword. So it still has a lot of momentum to it, and it moves very, very quickly at the tip, and it's got a lot of reach. So these can still hit very hard, and obviously if you've got a sharp edge on there, it's going to be unpleasant if you're getting hit in the head, or the arm, or the hands, or the shins, the knees, this kind of side of the knee, this kind of thing. Still going to do a lot of damage. So don't think that just because a blade is narrow that it can't cut, it often can, but equally don't think there's a really broad blade necessarily cuts better, because remember being very broad, it might sometimes move more slowly. But also, and that's what I think the main thing I'm trying to get across in this video is, don't always think that a sword is broad just because it's expected to be a heavier cutter. Sometimes a blade can be broad purely because it has been created out of less reliable materials in a period in which they trusted the materials and the heat treatment less, and the stakes were maybe higher, they couldn't risk a blade breaking, um, and so they made the blade broader so that it was less likely to break. It might bend, maybe, but it wasn't going to break. Um, better to hit someone with a, a blunt um, and not so effective you know, piece of steel that's still in one piece rather than have it break. One final thing I want to uh, throw into the mix though, just to contradict something. So again, I should have picked a better saber before I um, started doing this, but anyway, I'll continue with the, with the mini saber. One thing we do know is that in the 19th century, when people were using these sorts of sabers, um, we know that they did, during the Napoleonic and the Victorian periods, we know that they did um, cut various targets with them. Um, we know that they performed in war, we know that they could lop off bits of people, absolutely fine. And probably, statistically, sabres probably killed more people in history than longswords did, because there were more people alive in the world. You know, the population of uh, Norman England, I think, was about two to three million. The population of, of uh, Victorian um, Britain was, was about 40, 30, 40 million, I think. But anyway, so the populations were bigger um, by the 19th century, and, and warfare often involved much larger numbers of people. But um, in the 19th century, when people were using these sabres, when they were doing cutting feats, they did have these, okay? And this is essentially the Victorian equivalent of a falchion. And I have spoken about the, these swords before. This is actually made by Wilkinson and is the lead cutter number one. They came in four different sizes. They got progressively longer and broader and heavier. Uh, but these were for, as the name would suggest, a lead cutter for cutting bars of lead. But they were also used for cutting sheep, not live sheep, uh, you'll be happy to hear, or I hope you'll be happy to hear, um, but dead sheep strung up, and essentially the, the, the trick, the, the sword feet, as they were known, was to chop through the carcass with one blow with the sharp sword, okay, from different angles, and... Um, uh, there were various other sword tricks that they did. But it's interesting to me that when they had these specialised cutting feats, they did use extra wide swords. So there was a belief and an understanding that a broader blade did cut things that a thinner blade couldn't. But what you say, why didn't they fight with these? Well, quite simply, they didn't need to. <laughs> if this will do enough damage to the opponent with edge or point, or indeed the rapier will do enough damage with edge or point, 
You don't need to use the super broad cutting sword. There's no, as I've said in previous videos, there's no point using a sword that's heavy and cumbersome that could chop through an elephant's leg when you only need to ch chop through a human's leg, okay? So you use the, the lightest and quickest possible sword that you can that will still get the job done. So, just to conclude, I want to finish up by saying that there is quite a lot of evidence. Um, people like Dr. Alan Williams and other people um, who've been studying the metallurgy of the medieval and um, Renaissance eras, but equally the metallurgy in different places, um, the Middle East and India and Japan and China, there is quite a bit of evidence that sword blade design isn't always dictated by the use of that sword. So, you know, how much it's supposed to cut, how much it's supposed to thrust. There is quite a bit of evidence that just as important as those things, not to say they aren't important, but just as important as those things is the material that you're working with. And if we look at the design of Japanese swords, Japanese swords aren't only designed for their fighting needs. They're designed partly like that because of the materials that they had and the way that they had to make blades. Most of you will probably know that the distinctive curve of a Japanese katana or tashi blade and the tang is partly a product of the way that it's quenched, the way that it's edge quenched and it, the way that the um, steel forms when you do that. So by making a, a sword a certain way and having a certain material available to you dictates that weapon's design. And equally we know for fact that in the 17th century they were able to make more consistent, better quality blades in greater numbers than they had been in the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Technology improved, understanding improved, knowledge improved, and it got to a point where they could make more reliable weapons in a new shape that they hadn't made before. So just another thing to throw into the mix, um, feel free to share your views below. That's, and also, I just want to say that not saying that inherently a rapier is a better weapon than an arming sword. I know you guys love me to do direct comparisons, but it's all about the context. Um, but um, to a certain extent, you could say that technologically, a 17th century rapier on average is a better weapon than an 11th century arming sword because it's made of better materials with better understanding of heat treatment, uh, and a more scientific advancement behind it. Anyway, I hope that's been enjoyable to watch. Um, I know slightly long and rambling, uh, but share your thoughts below. Subscribe if you haven't done already, and I'll see you for the next video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.